dear rectors, vice rectors, and distinguished guests. A very good morning to all. On behalf of the European Women Rectors Association, I would like to welcome you to the fifth European Women Rectors Conference. Cher Rector, Vice Rector et Honorable Invité, un grand bonjour à vous tous. Au nom de l'Association des Dames Rectors Européens, je voudrais vous souhaiter bienvenue aux cinquième conférence des Dames Rectors Européens. I am the co-founder and deputy chairman of an engineering and manufacturing company specialized in steel structures in Turkey. As I am a true believer of women's capabilities in bringing solutions to today's problems, I feel deeply honored when President Salamer asked me to act as the MC at this distinguished gathering. Well, I'll try my best. Dear guests, first part of the conference will be devoted to the opening remarks. But before we start the session, we have a short video of Evora. So we will be all watching that. Women still remain a minority at all levels of power and decision-making in many countries across the world. Academic decision-making is also one of the areas where gender inequalities are very much widespread and visible. The European Commission is committed to foster gender equality as core policy in all its instruments, and one of the objectives of Horizon 2020 is ensuring gender balance in decision-making. In this framework, it's very timely and meaningful to introduce the European Women Rectors Association, IWARA. That is the fully-fledged international profit association. To now, I would like to invite President of EVORA, Professor Gülsün Salamer, to deliver her speech, please. Thank you very much, Eda, for the uh, starting the session. It has been successful, I think. Uh, distinguished guests, dear colleagues, it is my great pleasure to welcome you here at Solvay Library in Brussels for the fifth European Women Rectors Conference. I hope that this conference on pivoting on gender equality through the lens of leadership will be an important inspiration to overcome gender disadvantages in academia and a guide to advance gender perspectives in academic leadership. This is a great day for us. We have over 80 participants from 26 countries at this conference today. We are also very proud to have the great support of the higher education networks and the academics from many countries. At this occasion, I'm equally happy, happy to see both those friends with whom we started this journey and the new fellow participants. I thank you all with the hope and the expectation that this meeting will prove to be a memorable and worthy experience for every one of us. European Women Rectors Conference Series started in 2008 and has been held every two years. At these conferences, we have been coming together to share our experiences in order to make contributions to the development of the female participation at the decision-making levels of higher education and research. Following the formation of European Women uh, Rectors Platform in 2010, we decided to establish a legal entity in Brussels in 2014. In December 2015, with the help of seven founding members, 
the European Women Rectors Association gained its legal status under the Belgian law with a royal decree. With a royal decree. Our inaugural ceremony on 20th of June 2016 in Brussels attracted more than 70 participants and was honored by the European Commissioner for Research and Innovation, uh, Carlos Moedas. As you uh, already seen from the film, uh, the main aim of Evora is to establish, to develop strategies for increasing women at decision-making levels in higher education and research. Yes, dear colleagues, it's a great day for us all. We are honored to have such a distinguished audience of academics from different countries and representatives of different sections of European Commission and higher education and research networks. We are also very fortunate to have highly esteemed speakers with us. Every human being has the capacity to increase her or his efforts and performances if they are supported, encouraged, and recognized. Asymmetric success stories become inevitable unless these encouragement and support mechanisms are fairly distributed. Many people, as those of you are here, can be strong enough to cope with the professional or academic barriers in, in your career paths. I would, however, like to talk about those who keep waiting in vain while there are vacant positions on the table. Most of those people consist of women academics or professionals. The problem has several dimensions. The first one of which is the unconscious gender bias towards women in leadership. Therefore, we have to address the nature of the bias and the ways to remove the barriers rising from unconscious bias. We need to use efficient strate strategies for creating awareness on this issue in every segment of the academic organizations. Therefore, we need cultural change. Existing requirement and promotion, re recruitment and promotion processes in the higher education institutions constitute the second dimension of the problem. We need to make such improvements in these processes as providing gender balance in committees, better work-family balance arrangements, redefinition of excellence in science, fair distribution of awards and research funding, removing all sorts of structural barriers that reduce the promotion chances of female candidates. Therefore, we need structural change. The third dimension certainly involves the encouragement and empowerment of women academics and researchers. This task may be as difficult as the first two, since many women academics and researchers may not wish to run for higher positions. Removal of the barriers may not be successful to increase the female participation at decision-making levels, as long as reluctance, mostly due to learned helplessness, stays unsolved. Therefore, we need to re promote individual change by the empowerment and encouragement of women. Our actions have to inv involve changes at all three of the cultural, structural, and individual levels. In every change process, however, resistance is inevitable. In one of the work packages, the EC-funded FP7 project titled Female Empowerment in Science and Technology Academia, FESTA, between 2012 and 2017, we worked on resistance. During the course of project, activities in the partner institutions, changes to inter internal structures to advance gender equality were recommended in relevant areas. As the FESTA teams introduced key steps and essential elements of these changes, they encountered several incidents of resistance. The resistance cases recorded by the FESTA consortium and the analysis of these narratives provided us with important insights into the intersecting dynamics of resistance and the change process. 
as the outcome of Work Package 7, Handbook on Resistance to Gender Equality in Academia was prepared with the aim to give a deeper understanding of resistance against structural change towards gender equality in academia. The causes and forms of resistance were defined on the basis of a review of existing literature to help the reader to ask and answer why a resistance case occurred, how it happened, who was resisting. This handbook also provided recommendations to change agents who would like to remove the barriers in the organization as well as recognize the strategies to do this. As a digital toolkit, the handbook is now available online. Dear colleagues, leadership plays a crucial role in every change process. That was the main reason for establishing Evora. That is why we are all here. We have to discuss how to lead the change process in order to facilitate academics' commitment to change and create the bottom-up energy to make the change a reality or possibility. Dear colleagues, let me share with you a very personal note from my life. When I decided to run for rectorship in 1996, it was 20 years ago, I heard such things from my colleagues as, you are an architect and not an engineer, you are a woman, you, have, you do not have any chance in Istanbul Technical University. It's an old technical university established in 1773, so, and still dominated by men, so you shouldn't run for the rectorship. I said, okay, you may be right, but I intend to make important changes to free my university from the internal and external constraints. I was the only woman among 11 candidates. In that election, uh, I received the highest number of votes among all. The shortlist of three who scored the highest was sent by the Council of Higher Education to the President of the Nation, Mr. Suleyman Demirel, to appoint the new rector of Istanbul Technical University. At that stage, several male professors and a group of alumni intervened to remind the President that a woman who is also an architect not an engineer, is not suitable to be the rector of a technical university. President Demirel, an engineer by profession and also a graduate of Istanbul Technical University, answered, for the first time in the 220 years of my university's history, a woman professor with the great support of her colleagues is elected to be the rector. It will be a great pleasure for me to make this appointment. He not only appointed me, but also provided me with great support throughout my rectorship period. He was a great believer in democracy, and I, was, I always remember him with great respect. It was good old days. I'm also happy to have kept my promise to remove the barriers for change and development in the university. I would think that those of you who have been elected appointed as rectors, presidents, vice chancellors, also have interesting memories about those processes. I would like to collect them, you know, to, on our website. My guess is that the run, even if difficult, was worth to try. So my motto for younger generation is, go for it, you will get it. Dear colleagues, before I finish, I would like to thank all of you for being here and sharing your opinions and experiences with us. We have been honored by the presence of Helen, Helena Helmark Knudsen, Minister for Higher Education and Research in Swedish Government. She is going to address the audience uh, late afternoon. I would like to thank uh, her for her contribution to this conference. I also would like to thank our speakers and session chairs for devoting their precious time with us here. I would like to express my deepest gratitude to ITU Development Foundation, North Forsk, and Federation Wallon Brussels, together with Aiden Doan Foundation. Last but not least, I would like to thank Hülya Çağlayan. Where is she? 
uh, Hülya Çağlayan, who has demonstrated remarkable capacity for multitasking with her efficient and effective organizational skills and has made a substantial contribution to this conference. Dear colleagues, we have a long way to go to realize our dreams for gender equality, but we are very optimistic. We are also determined and committed to work together to create equal opportunities for all. I look forward to stimulating exchange over the next two days. Thank you very much.